Okay. Okay. Um, welcome to CLIMB Seminar. Uh, it's my honor to introduce Emmanuel Candace. Um, CLIMB Seminars uh, has been, uh, we started this on campus so that we can have a medium to talk about math, econ, stats, machine learning, CS, and many other fields. And uh, Emmanuel really represents this nice kind of connection between many of these fields uh, in his work. So Emmanuel is a professor uh, at Barnum Simons Chair in Math and Statistics at Stanford University and in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science by, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science by Courtesy. And uh, he's done a lot of work in statistics, uh, signal processing, information theory, and many other fields. He's won numerous awards, of course, including Alan Waterman Award from NSF, the um, MacArthur Fellowship, and a number of other awards. So we're really excited to have Emmanuel here and to uh, hear more about conformal predictions. Thank you thank very you. much, Nika, and thank you for the very kind invitation. There's a mistake on slide number one, which is it's not November 16, but I was supposed <laughs> to be here on November 16. Uh, and uh, I, I, I see, I'm, I'm hoping we have grad students in the room and I'm hoping you got what you wanted. Uh, because from us, uh, from our side of the bay, it seems like you were uh, after a just cause. And so, um, so I'm hoping that you're satisfied with the current situation. Okay, so I want to talk to you about conformal inference when data is non-exchangeable. And uh, before I get started, I want to acknowledge that what I'll be talking about today is uh, work with these four individuals, uh, Rina, Aditya, Ryan, and Isaac. You don't know how many IQ points there are on this slide. A lot. A lot. And so uh, Ryan uh, cannot be here today, but of course is a new colleague of yours. Um, so I'm going to take you to 2020, the presidential election results by county. So this is how America voted in 2020. Um, I should not say America has been banned from the Stanford list of words. I should say the United States. So that's how the United States voted in 2020, uh, county by county. So um, it, when you see a county with a dark blue color, it's a gain for the Democratic candidate from 2016 to 2020 by about 50%. When you see a dark red color, it's a loss by the Democratic candidate by about 50%. And on this map, we see clearly that Joe Biden improved on Hillary's scores by quite a bit and that the 2020 election was favorable to the Democratic candidate, as we all know. Now, if you were to work for a news organization, uh, you would like to inform your readership as the election is unfolding, how the election is going to go end up when all the votes have been tallied. And so uh, this is the work of uh, John Sherian and Lenny Bronner, and they're going to use the used ideas that you're going to hear about today to try to inform their readership as best as they could about where they think the election is going as we're counting votes. And because this is an application where the stakes are very high, where the cost of being wrong is very high, what they set out to do is to say, well, you know, it's election night, perhaps it's 11 p.m. Eastern time, and maybe a thousand counties have reported. I have 21 outstanding counties that have not reported. Can I learn from the 1,000 counties that have reported what these 2,100 unreported counties tallies are? But because the cost of being wrong is high and you want to be very uh, honest about what you know and honest about what you don't know, what they set out to do is to try to report a range of predicted values that would be correct most of the time. And so the goal they set for themselves was not to report point estimates, but rather a range of possible values that would include the true vote count that is already in the box, by the way, 90% uh, of the time. Okay, and so um, to do this, they used a lot of the ideas that you're going to hear about today. So what is it that they wanted to do is they wanted to do something like this. I've got training data, x1, y1, xn, yn, and at the xi's are covariates about each i is a county, and XIs are covariates about the county. It could be the general educational level, the income level, whether it's a rural or not a rural county. I mean, the kind of things that you're all familiar with. And YI is a vote for, let's say, the percentage vote for the Democratic candidate, or the vote change from 2016 to 2020. 
And so, you know, we imagine that it's election night, and then we have the map of the United States. There are about 3,100 counties in the United States, and uh, maybe the green counties have reported, and the white counties have not reported yet, and for each unreported county, you want to issue not a point prediction about the vote change, but you want to issue a prediction interval that would c contain the true label a certain fraction of the time so that you can inform your readership about what you really know about the election. And so the goal of conformal prediction and of predictive inference in general is to construct on the basis of training samples a, a range for the, a, a, a label Y that contains a label a certain fraction of the time, let's say 90% of the time. And, you know, this is a talk for people who already know a little bit about conformal inference, but if you do not know about conformal inference, what we want is we want this to be true no matter what the underlying distribution P of X, Y is, which is assumed to be completely unknown and any sample size N. And so the first time you see this, you say, well, that cannot be done because, you know, I have no model. I don't want to assume anything about the data generating mechanism. I don't want any, anything about the dimensionality. And so it cannot be done, but in fact it can be done, and we'll see that you can do it quite well. So what you want to be able to say, what the New York Washington Post wants to say, is like based on what we know about the election so far, and this new county that has not reported, but I know, you know, I have lots of demographic and, and social economic information about this county, I want to say that the vote change from 2016 is predicted between 3.1 and 7 points. And you need to be correct 90% of the time. Is it clear what we want to do? Okay, and so we have now methods to actually do this, and this is a field of conformal prediction, and you see on my slide a pioneer, uh, Vladimir Voft, whom I met last year, um, who really developed, largely developed the field. Uh, I also have another hero of mine, Jay Glenn Schaefer, uh, and they showed us how to construct valid prediction intervals under no assumptions on the data other than exchangeability. And so, because this is not a field, about, a, a talk about just what is conformal prediction, I'm going to just tell you how I think about conformal prediction, and then we're going to see, we're going to try to challenge the exchangeability assumption. So, conformal inference comes in different flavors. Uh, it comes, uh, we have full conformal, which was actually originally proposed. That's the first idea that came around. Then people realize it's not computationally tractable, so... They propose split conformal, and now we have, I think, methods that are really better than each of them, uh, which we developed with Rina, Aditya, and Ryan, um, ideas that blend together ideas from cross-validation with conformal, which I won't talk about, but um, I'm only going to talk about the first flavor, which is full conformal, which will give you the, the gist of conformal inference. So I'm going to do this through a picture, and so... Uh, it's not a math-heavy talk. Uh, it's going to be as illustrative as possible. So, so here's an example. So your boss gave you some data, and here they are. We have a bunch of X and Y. And now uh, a new uh, data point comes in, and we read Xn plus 1 equals 4.7. And 4.7 is indicated by the blue tick that we see over here. And what we want to do is we want to construct a prediction interval at that blue value, 4.7, that will contain Yn plus 1, which is not observed at the moment 90% of the time. So how are we going to do that? So what we're going to do is we're going to essentially uh, hypothesize the value of Y of the response, and we're going to see whether uh, this hypothesized value should be kept or not. So we're going to do some sort of hypothesis testing in some sense. And so I'm going to hypothesize that the, mo the, uh, va the value of yn plus 1 is little y. And I'm going to fit a model with this hypothesized value, and here it is. So this is a regression function. You know, I'm fitting a, a, a you know, I, think, I guess here it's like a spline regression or something. I fit a regression function, and I'm going to compute residuals. And here they are. So these are the misfits. And I'm going to look at how unusually large is the residual, the red residual, with the hypothesized value of y. Note that the model is fitted using xn plus 1 and y as well. 
And so I'm going to compute what we can think about a p-value, which is a fraction of residual with larger magnitude. So here, the p-value is 27%. That is, if I were to order the magnitude of the errors, this would be in the top 27% largest. And now I'm going to repeat this by you know, changing the value of y. And now the residual is a bit larger. And now the p-value is 22%. So it's about the, at the 78th percentile of the residual. And you know, I move it up. It doesn't change. I move it up. Boom, it's at 18%. So you get the idea. I like this animation because as this red dot is going to move, you're going to see that it's going to pull the, the regression line, well, the regression function towards it. It's going to pull it up, okay, which you're going to see. You, know, you see the little gray curve moving up. And now it's becoming an unusually large residual. You know, it's 2%, about top 2%, et cetera. Okay, and now it's, become, it's the largest residual now. Okay, so it's the largest residual. And so what I, what I, the end of the day I have is that for each proposed value of y, I have how, how large is the residual when I compare it with the others. So I have sort of these p-values as a function of y that are draw. And the way you're going to build a prediction interval is very simple. You, uh, this is, OK, first of all, this is computationally very expensive. And that's why people don't really use this stuff. It's because each time you propose a value, you have to refit the model. And so think about fitting neural nets. That's going to be a bit expensive. And that's why we have this alternative, which are uh, really, really attractive, the Jackknife Plus and the CV Plus. But I won't talk about it. So it's computationally expensive. But if you could do it, what we're going to do is we're going to construct the, an, uh, the prediction interval is a, the interval that corresponds to y for which p of y, the residual, is not in the top 10%. And that, what we mean, that's where the name comes from. It conforms to other residuals, meaning that it's not unusually large. Right? And that's how we're going to build the prediction interval. So. <clears throat> If I were to try to put this picture in mass, it's very, very simple. Now that we've seen how it operates, we observe exchangeable data and test data. And so imagine that I could have actually observe the test, the test label yn plus 1. Of course, I cannot. But suppose I could do that. Then um, I'm, what we did is we fit a model mu hat to all n plus 1 data points via a symmetric algorithm. What do I mean by a symmetric algorithm is the order in which I give you the point does not influence the fit. I compute my residual. I compute the errors, the misfits. And I'm going to check if Rn plus 1 is in the 90, bottom 90%. And if you follow, if you know what exchangeability means, think about exchangeability as IID. Then if the data point are IID or more generally exchangeable, then this thing, because I use a symmetric algorithm, these residuals are also exchangeable. And so Rn plus 1, if I just were to give you the list of all the residuals, is equally likely to be any one of them. In particular, it is in the bottom 90% with exactly 90% chance. All right? So exchangeability means that if I, get, I started to give you exchangeable data and you use a symmetric algorithm, then you're going to get residuals. In general, you're going to get conformity scores. But in this case, my conformity scores are just residuals. And they're exchangeable, these residuals, which means that if I were to give an unordered list of residuals and I say, which one is a test residual, you could not tell. And that makes conformal prediction works. Because now we're going to say, well, I'm going to propose a test value of y. We're going to fit the model. This is what we've seen, not with y n plus 1, because we don't get to see y n plus 1, but with little y. We're going to check if we impute little y whether I'm in the 90%. If you're in the bottom 90%, you're included in the prediction set. If you're not, you're not included. And so the result is that the chance that y n plus 1 is in the prediction interval, well, it has to be exactly 90%, because you know, it's a, prop, it's a chance that the test value y, you know, is, you answer yes, but you answer yes with exactly 90%. So it has to be 90%. And it's phenomenal, this thing, because it's not 93, it's not 87, it is 90%. You can make it exactly 90%. Okay, 
so this is, uh, this is how conformal prediction works in a nutshell. And, um, and I, ex I explain it on a special conformity scores, which happens to be residuals, like errors of a perhaps very complicated model. But you know we could compute these conformity scores any way you like, and this is where the field is developing at the moment. Is which can, you know, it's like now that we control the type one error, how we should make the type two error small. So this is about how to design good conformity scores. There's thousands of people working on it, uh, including us, but I won't talk about it today. Any question about this? It's a good time to. Start. Am I going too fast? Maybe. So people know conformal, I suppose, mostly. So this is conformal in my view. Uh, when I teach conformal prediction, which we now teach at Stanford because it's such a cool field, uh, people think about split conformal. Split conformal is it's exactly the same thing, except that you want to kind of get around the computational problem of having to refit the model. And so you split your data into a, a training set, and that's where you're going to fit mu hat, your, your neural net, and then you're going to calculate the conformity scores, the residuals on the calibration set. And of course, this is valid as well. This is exactly the same. And when just between you and me, when I teach, I don't even deal, deal with split conform because it is a special case of full conformal, a special case where the mu hat has been already pre-trained. And so it's a special case. There's no need to talk about it at the, at the statistics level. OK. All right, so split conformal is a special case, but it's an attractive case because it's computationally more favorable, even though you lose a lot of samples because now a data point is either used for, for uh, fitting or for calibration. And of course, the Jackknife Plus that we develop uses data points to do both. OK, so let's go back to the election night. And so these are the results. But of course, you would not know this. This is at, you know, a, a week after the poll closed that you would have a map like this. Let's say that. Um, we are drawing uh, counties at random. And so let's say that it's an experiment that I'm making now to show you that the, the method really works. And so, well, I have a population, and that population has 3,100 counties. And I'm going to draw 1,200 of these 3,100 counties at random. And I'm going to ask you to make a guess for the outstanding about 2,000 counties or 1,900 counties that are left. And uh, I, you see the coverage of this method across repeated draws of these 1,200 training points. And it's just unbelievable. Uh, my first experiment, I got 89.55, um, 19.19, you know, it's just like, just too good to be true. And uh, you know, this is using the scores I gave you. And if you were to use better scores in the sense that you have shorter intervals, which we call uh, conformalized quantile regression, uh, it is exactly the same numbers. And so I did it 25 times, and we get these box plots, and you know, it's super tight around 90. OK, so there was a momentous event. Um, what, what, when was it? Like November 29th, 2022, ChatGPT came online. And so Aaron Roth who works in the field, asked ChatGPT to write a rap battle between CP and parametric statistics. And that's what ChatGPT writes. Uh, OK, so you know, maybe I'll let you read conformal prediction. I'm the new kid on the block with a framework that can't be stopped. Parametric statistics, you're feeling the shock. Of the, you know. So you have to imagine, like, I could put a, a cap. I could put a, a hoodie. Uh, but it's not bad, you know, conform prediction. So this is a chorus. They all have, you know. It's good. It's good. It's better than what I can do in two hours. <laughs> it's better what, probably better than what I can do in six hours. It's maybe not better than what I can do if you give me a week. You know, so it starts to be a bit repetitive, I feel. Like, I don't think ChatGPT explores too many themes here. Um, but, you know, it's not bad. <laughs> Well, OK, I'm teaching. Uh, I'm recorded. Yeah, I'm recorded. I'm teaching uh, matrices this quarter, and uh, I'm asking ChatGPT to solve my problem sets. What a disaster. 
with, to the point that I think that in my midterm I'm going to put questions says this is what chat GPT says the answer is what do you think <laughs> all right okay um, so it's it's a good it's a really much good. okay well let's go back to uh, statistics so is my data exchangeable and of course it is not because everybody who follows the news we know that as counties report they don't report in a random order Rural counties tend to report earlier. Counties on the eastern side of the United States tend to report earlier. Uh, less populous counties, of course, tend to report earlier. And so it may very well be that when it's 11 p.m. at night on, on Tuesday night in Eastern time, or even California time, I don't care, that maybe 1,200 counties have reported. That is much is true. But that the counties that have reported are not representative of what's left outstanding. And so here is a mock-up of this thing where I'm going to uh, pretend that the counties that have reported are the counties located in the eastern time zone of the United States. We're going to talk about other things. You know, we're going to talk, you know, if I want to predict the stock market, the stock market is not stationary. So this is a lack of exchangeability. And so it may shift in response to world events. So. I just repeated the experiment I, I, I made, which is like now my training set is not drawn at random. So by drawing a training set at random, I create exchangeability by design. But now let's say that my training set is just the eastern part of the count. And then I repeat the procedure. Then I get this. I get that, no, the coverage is not 90%. It's 74% or 78%. Wolf would say that this is a certificate of non-exchangeability. It shows, it proves that the data is non-exchangeable, that you can actually bet money on non-exchangeability and win and make money and become wealthy, right? So this is a certificate of non-exchangeability. So we have a problem that when you want to apply conformal prediction, even though chat GPT seems like it's great and all people who do parametric statistics should go to find other jobs, well, we still have work to do because a lot of the data I'm working with in, in, in is not exchangeable, so we're going to need to, to deal with that. And so this is the main bulk of this lecture after this introduction is we're going to need to adapt to distribution shift. And so we're going to see two ideas. The first one, I'm going to go in order of difficulty. The first one is we call adaptive conformal inference, and this is with Isaac Gibbs. And I would say this is not too subtle. Well, I should not say this, but it's less subtle. The second is, I think, quite subtle. It's so subtle that sometimes I'm looking at the result and I'm asking, what does it say, really? But we'll see. OK. So this is with Isaac. And when I say it's not subtle, I don't mean to be diminishing. I mean that it's great, but it's not. You know, okay. OK, so we observe a data stream x t, y t. So we're going to be in a sort of online setting. We observe a data stream. We think about the stock market, the COVID-19, the pandemic develops. And so we see a data stream. And we think that x t, y t is distributed as p t, but p t changes with time. And my boss asks me, you know, Emmanuel, predicts the stock market tomorrow. And I would be a fool to think that 2020 looks like 2018. It doesn't look like 2018. But still, I would like to form a prediction interval that, that w works at least 1 minus alpha fraction of the time. And I would like that every time point, if possible, the coverage is 1 minus alpha. So we're going to try to adapt conformal uh, inference to distribution shift. And what makes conformal inference work is that when I compute my conformity scores, for example, my residuals, I have the observed conformity scores, uh, and this is a histogram, the empirical histogram that you see in purple. I have the true test conformity scores that I'm about to see. And what conformal prediction relies on is the fact that these two histograms line up. And so, you know, we have the future residual scores, the distribution of future residual scores. We have the empirical, and they line up. And so whenever I pull the, the quantile of the, 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 the purple histogram, it is a quantile of the future things that I'm about to see. But you know, when the world changes, this may not be the case. 
And so there are a lot of people who say, well, you know, I'm going to work in high dimension and KL divergence. But no, we're not going to do any of that stuff. We're going to think that are far more simple and I think far more practical. So the future distribution at time t may actually be shifted to the left. It might be shifted to the right. I don't know that. But what, however it's shifting, what I'm saying is that you know, I want 10%, I want 90% coverage, so I want to find the 10% of this thing. And so what I'm saying is that the 10%, the 90th percentile of the red curve, what percentile is it of the purple histogram? So that's the thing. If I knew this, if I knew the 90th percentile of the red curve, is it the 80th percentile of the purple histogram, the one I observed, or is it the 5th percentile? But if I knew this, then I would know how to build perfect prediction intervals. Of course, I don't know it, but can we learn it? And so this is the simplest <laughs> equation. It's embarrassing to propose this to talk about this at Berkeley, but we're going to try. So there's a, we're going to reduce the, pro the problem of making a prediction to a problem of which percentile of the purple histogram should I use. If I think that the residual gets larger, right, I should use a higher percentile because the residual I've seen so far are too small. So I should not use a 90, I should probably go 95. If I feel that we enter a period of low volatility, I should go 85. Can I actually detect that? And so this is the equation that we're going to say. We say, well, there's these parameters, these oracle parameters that we don't know, but we're going to try to track it using an online update. And so we're going to have, uh, uh, we're going to try to estimate which quantile we should use by using a very simple recursion. And this is saying that you are using alpha t, now you're going to use alpha t plus 1 plus gamma times alpha minus an error term. So the coverage is here, I speak like a statistician. So the coverage is 90%. So alpha, if we were not adapting to anything, alpha would be 0.1. Okay? And so, what I'm going to do is, this is the error. And so this is the error, like yesterday, did I make an error? Did I cover or did I not cover? And so what you can see if this equation does is like, if I made a mistake, I did not cover, it's probably because my quantile is too low. So you should pump it up. And so this equation says, if I did not cover, one minus alpha t will go up. So go and hire the quantile you should use. If you cover it, you're probably too conservative, lower it a bit. So as cannot be simpler. And we're going to see later on that this can be understood as an online gradient descent algorithm, and then we can use this insight to choose a step size gamma by how much you know, do you want to react fast, do you want to react slowly, what do you want to do? And so uh, this is going to be helpful, this point of view. But what right now I want to show you that when you do something like this, um, uh, things go well. So this is our problem from before where I need to predict the counties outcomes from east to west. So I ordered the counties, I look at the state capital, and the first county was the, most, the easternmost county, and the Hawaii is last. Okay, and what we're looking at is we're looking at a moving average of coverage, otherwise we just see 0, 1, 0, 1, and we could not see anything. So we see a, a moving average over 300 counties, consecutive counties, and we see two curves. The, the blue curve is the county that uses the curve that uses this dynamic update, right? Which quantile should I use? Okay. And the red curve is not doing things. It's just saying, no, what you've seen is representative of the future. You're going to use a 90th percentile no matter what. And here we see what Volk says. It's, it's, uh, you can bet against exchangeability because you enter the Midwest right here. And I'm sorry, but you know, what you've seen so far does not help predicting the Midwest. And so you see a dramatic loss of coverage. And by the way, the, co the coverage average over all counties, uh, outstanding counties, is going to be way below what you want. But if you start to adapt, then you see this curve that, first of all, its average is exactly 90%. That's a surprise. And the second, we see a third curve here. And what is this third curve? This is just plotted for illustrative purposes. This is what I want to call the gold standard. The gold standard is each day you toss a coin which has probably 90% of success, independently of each other. 
So this is like the ideal situation. And so this is the average of the error. It's, a, it's kind of a smooth average of, of Bernoulli random variables. And what's kind of remarkable for me, at least eyeballing, is that the excursion of the blue curve are sort of on par with the gold standard. It's not clear how would I prove on the blue curve. All right. Different things where things have changed a lot. The stock market. So we're trying to now predict volatility in the stock market. This is, um, you know, in, in finance, you have two quantities of interest. You have the return of a stock, but you also have the squared return, which is what people say is the volatility. It's like you don't care about the sign. You just care about the magnitude of the change. Here we're trying to predict volatility. And you see, like, we're going from 2005 to 2020, and we have companies. And, you know, some of these companies in 2008 experienced some dramatic changes, and nothing is stationary here. And so if you apply conformal predictions uh, out of the box, you know, you're going to get enormous loss of coverage, especially through the 2008 crisis. But if you apply the sort of the method we've seen, like the blue method, you start hugging the curve, and the fluctuation of the blue path is on, of the same order of magnitude of the fluctuation of the gold standard. So it seems to be doing very well, at least in practice. OK, so we can get some theory for this. And we can get a lot of theory. And so these are the theories is what you'll find in two New York papers. But um, because I don't have much time, I'm, I'm just going to give you a cute result. And in the spirit of this talk, it's going to be distri distribution free as well. And so it's a theorem. So you're going to see two results in this lecture. One. Uh, and they make no assumptions. And so here's a result that makes no assumption, is that the people have voted the way they have voted. You know, this is, I don't think about it stochastically. It is what it is. And you apply this thing, and what you are guaranteed is that you're guaranteed that over the long run, the error rate is exactly what you want. Exactly what you want. In fact, you can tell, you can bound the error rate, the, average error that you're going to make over time with a target, and it goes down like 1 over t, no matter what. And of course, we can say that any given time, we can get 1 minus alpha, and we develop results like this, assuming that we sort of have a Markov model, so we have regime changes, and, and things like that. It looks like an online kernel result. This, uh, this one is, is very much inspired by the online learning literature, although we have an argument that we could not find in the online learning literature. Yes. OK. All right, so the connection to online learn learning that uh, Mike just brought up, he said that I can look at this update as online gradient descent. But that online gradient descent on what random variable and what loss, and that's where it gets a bit tricky. But it is actually an online gradient descent algorithm. And so what do we trying to do here? So you're going to compute. So at any given time, I can give you an 80% prediction interval, 90%, 95. And we're going to define a random variable, which is the smallest level at which you would have included the unseen observation. So this variable will be 49% if yt belonged to your 49% interval, but not in your 48% interval. And that's ut. 1 minus ut is, in my example, 49%. It's the smallest level at which you contain the observation that was just revealed to you. So that's ut. And now we have the pinball loss, uh, which is, I think, a loss that everybody knows. And so what you can think about this update is, well, you're going to apply, you're going to try to take a gradient step of the pinball loss, apply to this random variable ut, which measures at which level would you have just included the variable of interest. And now that we have this, uh, then we can say, all right, so there was this kind of critical parameter, gamma. Should you react quickly? Should you react slowly? And of course, the stock market. Sometimes you need to be reactive, and sometimes you may want to be less reactive. And so what you could do is you could say, well, I have different views on, on gamma, and this is, starts to be a bit classical. 
you have different views of gamma, so you have different agents, and some of them are reacting rapidly, and some are quite slow. And you could judge each of these agents by their losses on this pinball loss and this random variable I just introduced. And then you can sort of have an algorithm that was essentially proposed by Wolf a long time ago, um, which says, like, follow the soft leader. Like, follow, follow the leader in a soft way. And so we judge the uh, agents by their losses, and then we're going to sort of give higher weights to the agents that recently experienced small losses. And so we can develop a lot of theory for this. And I think an early instance of this is in, in, in one of Ock's paper from the 1990, actually. So, all right, so now that we have this interpretation, we can do this. And I feel that this starts to be quite foolproof because now, you know, there was this free parameter, gamma, and, you know, we explained that we could have a view, different views on gamma and have agents compete and follow the, the person who happens to do well. This is a, a, a prediction problem where we're actually trying to predict case counts of COVID-19 in different parts of the United States, San Francisco, New York, Miami, Dallas. Of course, this... Um, places have very different behaviors. Like they are, I can tell you, I've been to Miami uh, over Christmas and they don't behave like people in San Francisco. They do not behave like San Franciscans at all. And, you know, whatever the county is, you know, you look at this blue curve and it's just hugging the 90% line. But of course, if you're not adaptive, then, um, then, then things are trouble. Okay, so one thing that we did we were, uh, with Isaac, we were happy about this uh, because it seems like when we test this and we really put this to a stress test, it works really well. Um, we wanted to make sure that when we use, because I think you have to be careful with that. Uh, we want to make sure that any given time we have roughly coverage 90%. So one thing I was concerned about when we did this was that one way you can achieve 90% coverage over the long run is to say 90% of the time create an infinitely wide interval, 10% of the time create an infinitely short interval. But that's not, you know, so you could do bang, bang, like what in control where you'd say, you know, bang, 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 and you would get over time, you would get what you want, but that's not useful. So I wanted to make sure that when I, when one minus alpha t, is much below 1 minus alpha t, do I do this because I want to correct errors I've made? I, oh, I had a lot of errors, so now, no matter what, I'm going to be correct a, long t a lot of times. And vice versa, I was too conservative, now it's time that I make errors. Is this happening? Because if this is happening, this is not interesting. If all I'm doing is correcting errors, not paying attention to the future, but just correcting errors, that's not interesting. But this is not what happens. And so this is um, like the coverage of the, uh, the volatility of AMD, which, uh, of course, experienced tremendous swings. And this is, here we plot, when we plot, plot 1 minus alpha t, that when you use the 80th percentile, do we use the 80th percentile to correct errors, or do we want use the 80th percentile because it's going to give us 90%? And what this plot shows, this is the red dots are the mean, is that when we use 80, we get 90. When you use 82, we get 90. When you use 85, we get 90. We use this thing because we need to, not because we want to correct mistakes, and that's important to me. Okay, so this is not just reacting to past errors. It's actually trying to really do a good job at any given time. Okay. All right, so this is uh, maybe the end of the way when you can think about marrying uh, conformal prediction with online learning. The second part of trying to move beyond exchangeability, so this assumes really an online setting where, you know, counties that revealed one, yes. So I, have a qu I have a question on that, on just your last thing. So you empirically observed that you're not just sort of doing bang bang or whatever you want to call it. Is there some way to formulate that mathematically? Yes. And Yes. Can you and comment is, on that? Yeah, so this we formulated mathematically, and this is what I say. There's a lot of theory that we try to model. So we say we, we formulated a hidden Markov model. So we have different regimes about the distribution of X and Y. 
And when can we say that, so we have a Markov model, hidden Markov model, where we go through regime changes, and we say, at, at any given time t, I know the alpha star t that you should be using. I'm going to use alpha t, and can I bound the distance between the two? And we have lots of results about that. So you can, you can be very mathematical about this. OK. And the last thing that I want to talk about is work with these three people, uh, amazing people. Um, OK. And now we're going to go back to the roots of, uh, of conformal inference. So conformal inference assumes exchangeability in two places, uh, really. There are two important things. One is I need to give you exchangeable data. The, the past needs to be a representative of the future. And so I need to give you exchangeable data. But also, you need to treat data exchangeably. That is, you cannot have an algorithm that says, oh, you know, at this point, I'm going to discard them. I'm just going to use the first one you gave me. Because what you need at the end, what will make conformal prediction work, is that when you look at the test residual Rn plus 1, you need to be, it can be any one of them. And so conformal in prediction relies on two things, exchangeable data and treating data points symmetrically. And we're going to break both of these, because we're going to have to. So we're going to think, so now we're going to move away from the online setting, because after all, you know, it's election night, and I need to call 1,900 counties now, not after seeing the next one and the next one. I need to make a call on these 1,900 things now. And so for exchangeable data and a symmetric algorithm, Exchangeability means that Rn plus 1 is a random draw of what you've already seen. But for non-exchangeable data, for example, as I move from east to west, what if there's more volatility? What if things are less predictable? Then it is not true that a western county is a random draw of eastern county. That's not the case. And so what we want to ask is, is it possible to approximate Rn plus 1 as a random draw from what I've seen. What else do I have? I only have the conformity scores I calculated, but a weighted f distribution, where maybe some counties will be up-weighted, maybe counties that look, sort of look like me, and some counties will be down-weighted, maybe counties that do not look like me. So if I'm about to predict Berkeley, well, maybe I should not use a rural county, maybe I should down-weight a rural county in Alabama. OK. <clears throat> now, I want to say that I know a lot of you work in conformal inference. That is a very scary proposition. Because if we start to introduce weights, then everything breaks. So using weights will actually completely violate the exchangeability argument. That is, when we use conformal prediction, and the weights are all 1 over n plus 1 here, we say that this is the same as this. And that is at the heart of conformal prediction. That what I can say about n plus 1, the test residual, is the same as what I can say about a, a training residual, because they're exchangeable. But the minute I introduce weights that are going to introduce a, a, a lack of symmetry about it, this is wrong. And so if you try even to use weights, even under exchangeability, and you say, let's go ahead, the, everything will break loose. Right? Because, because this quantize of this weighted distribution is not symmetric anymore in the, in the residual scores. And so it's not exchangeable. This is not equal to this. And therefore, the prediction interval may not have at all 90% coverage, either if, even if I give you exchangeable data. But we're going to still try to do it. Right? So we're going to. We're going to try to predict, construct prediction set from custom weighted quantiles. We're going to compute our things as before. We're going to compute our test, our proposed residual as before. And we're going to include y if the residual is not less than the empirical quantile of the residual, but of the weighted residuals. Now, how do I pick in this example of this election the wi? Well, we can talk about it maybe during the Q&A. Basically, I'm going to look at the demographic variables and, I'm, and all the social variables and say, 
if sort of in X space you're close to me, you're going to get a high weight. If you're far away, you're going to get a low weight. Okay. And so when we do this, uh, we're going to see two flavors of next CP, a non-exchangeable conformal prediction. When I put weights, you know, the coverage was 74. It's not 90, but it gets better. So it gets closer. To, so using weights seems to help. And it helps both the naive method and the more fancy methods. They were lacking coverage. And now it's not 90. It's not perfect, but it's get, it gets better. OK, so in, a, in, in practice, using these weights appears to correct for non-exchangeability. So here is what you can say. And this is, again, the second result we're seeing. And these results, what I like about it is like it makes no assumption. I mean, it's not very often that we see a result that makes no assumption. But it makes no assumptions. The data is what it is. The method you've seen, I'm just going to calculate, I'm going to include y if it's below the 90th percentile of some weighted distribution of the residuals. And the result says like this, fix the weights wi, so they sum up to 1, and the maximum weight you give it to the test point. Then the coverage is 90% minus this stir. So we may experience a loss of coverage. In fact, we saw that we had a little bit of loss of coverage. You know, we got you know, 8% or 6% loss. And it's this term. And what is this term? It's the sum of the wi, the weight you gave, and then the total variation distance between the conformity scores that you would get and the conformity scores you would have gotten if you had swapped the test point with the training sample number i. OK, so the conformity scores, these are the conformity scores. Um, right, so these are there. And so this, the conformity scores, if when I gave you the data, I had swapped the training point i with a test point n plus 1. That's it. Now, I think that this result is, this is interesting. It's new. Uh, it's interesting. And the reason it's interesting is because I want to make several comments about it. The first is I treat data points non-exchangeably now because I'm going to weight, upweight some, some data points, downweight others. So I'm breaking what Vladimir has been telling us and I'm breaking it in a very bad way. But if the data points you gave me happens to be exchangeable, then this term goes away. If the data points you gave me were exchangeable, then the test scores are exchangeable, and this is 0. So I do no harm. Under exchangeability, I get perfect coverage. That's important, even though I'm starting to use weights that are not at all like 1 over n plus 1. If you happen to give me exchangeable data, no harm has been done. So it's a strict extension of conformal prediction. Two, we're going to have a mild coverage loss. So you see, this could be, this could be quite different, because maybe a rural county does not look like Santa Clara. But if I give a low weight to these rural counties, this is going to be small. And so if somehow, when this distance is large, I was clever enough to give it a low weight, then this is small. OK, so under, uh, under a mild violation of exchangeability, there's going to be a very mild coverage loss. The last point I want to make, for those of you who know about conformal prediction, is that if I choose the weights to be 1 over n plus 1, which is what Vladimir says they should be, 1 over n plus 1, but if the data is not exchangeable, then what coverage can you expect? Well, we can expect at least this. And what's nice about this result is that we see a lot of 1 over n plus 1, and it's going to be not the distance between the data points, which would be like enormous, right? because we're in very high dimension. It's just the distance on the conformity scores you calculate, which may be small. Because y1, x1 can be very different from y2, x2, but if the conformity scores is actually fishing a dimension that is, you know, they might be because on some dim dimension they are very different, but if the conformity score is sort of orthogonal to this, like, who cares? Okay. So these results are quite broad. They apply to any symmetric algorithm and weighted CP. As you'll see in a minute, they also apply to any non-symmetric algorithm 
and weighted CP. We, for, to do this, we're going to have and use an internalized randomization step because the thing that we have not talked about yet is I'm still using a symmetric algorithm here, but maybe, you know, when I have to predict Santa Clara, which is over here, then maybe when I fit my model, I don't want to treat, I want to upweight in my model fit counties that look like Santa Clara. I want to learn more. I want to upweight them when I fit the mu hat. We have not talked about this, which will actually break the symmetry of the algorithm, which is the second tenet of conformal prediction. Okay, and so, um, so we want to upweight counties like me when we fit the model. So for example, you have a time series I want to upweight, and we're in 2023, I want to give more weight to 2020 than to 1970. And that would break the, the, the requirement of OFC that the algorithm is symmetric. Choosing weights, I should say, is non-trivial, but simple schemes to, seem to work well. So in the general case, there's going to be an extra inter, inter, a randomization step to make it work. So now suppose that you use a non-symmetric algorithm. Non-symmetric, I mean, give higher weights to counties like me, give higher weights to, to um, is a recent past, anything you like. It's a non-symmetric algorithm. Now, you know, the output, the regression function you get depends on the order in which I, you gave you stuff. So now we're going to draw a random index k, uh, where the chance that k is i is wi. We're going to fit a model, but the, the randomization step is that I'm going to exchange in the list the hypothesized value. I'm going to put it in position i, in position k, and I'm going to answer it. So when I fit the algorithm, I'm going to perform a swap. You have an algorithm that depends on the order. Well, when I fit the algorithm, I'm going to perform this swap. Particular, you know, I want to present, I suppose this is a time series I want to present today. You know, let's say I have an exponentially decaying weight. As I'm going in the past, I'm going to, you're going to go a few days backwards. Okay, and I'm going to compute the residual and everything as, as before. Now you do that, and the same result is true. This is still true. But now I use a non-symmetric algorithm. I can give higher weights, higher priority to data points that look like me. And still this is true. OK, I have to wrap up, I suppose. So uh, I think that my time is almost up. Um, so it's exactly the same guarantee as before. And pictorially, it's, OK, maybe we'll skip that. I just want to show you some, some experiments. So this is a real data set that was actually analyzed by Vladimir in a nice paper. Um, this is um, the amount of electricity that is, is being exchanged between two provinces in Australia. And so you want to predict the next exchange. And this exchange happens every 30 minutes. And uh, you have the blue curve. And this is the blue curve, the coverage of the naive prediction interval. And then you have a yellow and red curves. And the yellow and red curves are using this sort of weighted conformal prediction uh, algorithms. One is, so one is actually treating the data point symmetrically, and that's a yellow curve. And then one is treating the data point non-symmetrically, and that's a red curve. And what we see is that we see, as Wolf observed, that you can bet against non-exchangeability. That's obvious. These two methods, they vary, again, hugging the 90% line. And now what is interesting about the, the blue curve, the, the difference between the red and the gold curve, is that if we look at the length of these intervals, which is here, and the length of this interval, we see that here we have sort of a change. Well, all of a sudden, the intervals need to be wider. But as the situation gets back to normal, you know, the red curve, which learns, which has weighted, like in its learning algorithm, also weighting the thing, goes back down more quickly than the gold curve, which is more symmetric. So it takes a much longer time for the gold curve to come back down. OK, and so we have lots of simulations. But OK, my time is up. I really love conformal prediction. This is, I gave a, a big lecture at NeurIPS this year, and that was my takeaway message. What I like about predict, uh, conformal prediction is I think when we're dealing with applications where the cost of being wrong is so high, we should be honest about what we've learned from the data. That's why we collect data. 
And to say to a judge, yes, you're going to commit another crime is, to me, a crime. And so we should convey what we've learned from data analysis and machine learning in a more principled way, communicating the uncertainty we have about our prediction. So we need to be honest about what we've learned from data. My job is not to make policy. My job is to make a risk assessment call. And, and at least when we run conform prediction, we know how much we don't know. Because if the intervals are wide, then you have to be honest about it. That's what you know, and don't pretend you know more. There's an explosion of interest in this field. Um, I guess 1,000 plus papers per year. An explosion of interest in industry. A lot of industry people are talking about conform prediction these days. It's very well understood when we have exchangeable data, less understood when we have distribution shift, but I hope that this talk will give you um, the desire to maybe join me in understanding how we can adapt conform prediction in, under distribution shift. Thank you. Thank you so much for a great talk. Um, we're going to take a couple of questions, and please raise your hand so I can bring you the microphone. Thank you, Emmanuel, for a great talk. Uh, I wonder in the first in the first work, how much uh, how much uh, does the original distribution of residuals play a role once you're already online, going through the different quantiles? So does it make a very is it very important to get the original distribution of residuals correct, or in that case, I mean, we can in some sense, almost put a, say, normal distribution and run over the, the quantize. I mean, how much does it matter to catch the, no, the no, correct distribution? It matters a lot because this distribution may have fat tails. This distri and you can, in, in, when you could do, when you unroll conform prediction, you're going to compute it anyway because you're going to compute your conformity scores. So you, you have it. And I think it matters a great deal because the things, it's very hard to, understand the shape of this distribution before you can even look at it. So it matters a great deal in my experience. Even if you are even if you're adjusting the quantile that you're looking at the distribution. Yeah, yeah. Because it could be that even this distribution is is bizarre, right? You may have like even if you fit neural nets for example, you may have a lot of zero residuals because they will interpolate and some of them will not interpolate. So you, then you have out, outliers. So you need to see that to understand what can I expect from a test point. We have time for one more question. Uh, <laughs> First of all, a great talk. Uh, I get, I'm very enthusiastic about conformal. Every time I see you speak about it, I get even more enthusiastic. Uh, the D sub CV, could you unpack that just a little bit? I usually think of um, total variation distance is something you have to, you have, it's an integral, and uh, can you tell me, like, when can you know it? Uh, after just having seen data, can you know is it? This, this guy? Is it a combinatorial? It looks like it's just a discrete calculation. It's a discrete calculation, except I don't know it because yeah. I don't know the distribution of the data, yeah. and so I cannot calculate it. And so, so this is what I can tell. You know, it's like, um, when I do non-parametric regression and I assume, uh, I do a regression and I assume sparsity and I say, if the sparsity is this, you get this bound. But if the sparsity is this, I don't know. So this is a similar flavor. Oracle inequality. Yeah, it is kind of this. Now, I, I cannot calculate this, but it might be that if we can start, you and I writing some, down some models, like, oh, I have a linear model and you know, and the volatility goes like this, and the coefficients switch, but no, we, we will be able to calculate this. But you're right. I mean, it I sounds have like a cool research project. Yes, look at this exactly. thing. Under this is not easy. And I'm more bringing a little bit of model based kind of reason. Yes, so to actually put your say, and, and that's kind of, no, you, you're also asking about things. Like, I look at this and say, what does it say, really? It says that, well, it says that if I manage to actually, you know, okay, let, let's, here's what it says, which I'd like to think about. It's like, I have the counties in the United States, and some of, is there an exchangeable subset in that set of counties? Probably, right? Somehow, suppose I gave them weights one, and the non-exchangeable, I gave them zero, and this would be zero. And of course, it's not, I don't know that, but, 
another strata where it's Yes, uh, yeah. And how do you make this a bit more telling is what we discuss in my office with my students all the time. Because what does it really say? I mean, it's very clean, but it's not because it's clean that it says a lot. But to me, that's a question of the day. What does it say? What it says is that if I'm exchangeable, even though I treat you non-symmetrically and non-exchangeably, the coverage is exactly what you want. It says this, which is not a trivial thing. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I know there are more questions, but we're going to take them offline in the interest of time. Thank you so much for a great okay, talk. Thank you.